Hello, folks. This is your host, Tammy Tucky, and you are now listening to the Tierra Talk Show. We bring you rare interviews with the makers of Disney magic. Whether they be singers, actors, imagineers, animators, they have all made their mark on the Disney name. Be sure to check out the show notes, other episodes, contests, our social media pages from Facebook to Twitter, and more on our official website at www.thetierratalkshow.com. Are you looking to plan and book an upcoming Disney vacation? Contact the Tierra Talk Show's official travel agent, James from Destinations in Florida, by visiting destinationsinflorida.com backslash tiara for a free quote. The link is also included in the show notes on our website. All guest opinions are theirs and theirs alone and do not represent the opinions of the Tierra Talk Show or the host. The Tierra Talk Show is not associated with the Disney Company. Thank you for tuning into this week's episode. And from all of us here at the Tierra Talk Show, have a hoop de doo day. I'm excited to welcome this week's Tierra Talk Show guest, voiceover artist Kat Cressida. Welcome, Kat. <laughs> Thank you so much, Tammy. It's Great exciting to-, to be here. I know. I'm very excited to have you on the show. I, I, I love talking to people who are in the voiceover business because I've heard it's a very difficult business to be in and, and get certain jobs and that type of thing. But could you talk about how you first got into the voiceover business? That's a great question. And it's, def- I mean, you know, obviously it's not the first time that I've been asked it, but every time I'm asked it, I do take a beat to just, first of all, sort of assess, okay, where is what are things now, and how are they? How have they changed over the past three years, five years, ten years? Um, I've been really fortunate to be doing it now for, I, I think it's sixteen years. Is from the first time that I my first workshop. So, you know, as you can imagine, technology very different back then. Um, I mean, we did have cell phones, but they were not little mini computers, and people did not have home studios and voiceover. Back then, when I first started taking workshops, was a very different landscape. There was a very specific group, a very um, gifted, talented, um, diehard group that that's what they did was voiceover. And for the most, there was some crossing over, but there was um, the people who did animation, the people who did commercials, the people who did trailers and promos, which for the most part back then were all men. It's really changed dramatically in a fantastic way. Now it's open to women, and I do a lot of promos and trailer work as well. I I think one of my first jobs after I took my first few voiceover workshops, um, they they were probably for games. I feel like the first one was for a pilot game, um, sort of like an Air Force pilot. And back then, they didn't even have the technology to do what games now Games now can have endless dialogue. I mean, it could go on for like 10 hours of wall-to-wall dialogue. And back then, they only had the technology where they could do one-liners here or there. It it didn't have the depth that they could record that much. And um, very quickly after that, one of the things, one of the reasons that I had been enchanted with perhaps exploring voiceover truthfully was having heard about something called voice matching, which is a very specific part of voiceover where you're basically voice doubling uh, for a celebrity who is not available for certain aspects of a project or certain, you know, for example, if it's a big Disney character or Pixar character, they have some awesome, amazing celebrity who created this voice, but then they've got all these ancillary things like parades and ice shows and toys and you know, video games and stuff, the wazoo. Like, there's one thing called a door stopper. I was like, what's a door stopper? But it was a toy mechanism for kids. They'll have someone who's sort of the, the backup for when the celebrity is not available. And uh, I was fascinated with the fact that this was sort of this audio illusion was going on where it really sounded like the character, but it was someone else was fortunate to take a few early classes with some of the greats. And that was really exciting to to learn that there were different things you could do with your voice. And then one of my first gigs, I think it was in the first three or four months of being signed with a, a little, one of the smaller voiceover agencies was they were looking for um, Dee Dee, you know, for Dexter's Laboratory. It had been a thesis project 
uh, by Gandhi, the creator, when he was at CalArts as a student. It was literally his graduate thesis project, and uh, somehow it had managed to get picked up um, for just a small number of episodes. It was when Cartoon Network was brand spanking new. I think they had Cow and Chicken. Anyway, it was obviously an incredible team to get the honor to sort of cut my teeth, um, you know, in animation working on, but I was a newbie. I knew practically next to nothing when I started that in terms of the microphone or mic technique or placement or proper direction, and suddenly I'm in this room with these, I mean, I'm not exaggerating, with these legends, you know, Frank Welker, Tom Kenny, um, Jeff Bennett, Rob Paulson, Kat Suisei. Chris Cavanaugh, God bless her. You know, I mean, it's just first uh, Donna was the first voice director, and then Colette Sunderman uh, took over at a certain point, and they were just really amazing at sort of holding my hand as I learned voiceover as I was, you know, learning the first season or so. And then luckily the, the show went on to many, many more seasons. I was just felt lucky to be a part of it. So, And around the same time, you're doing several voiceovers <laughs> for Disney. You, you did some of the gorilla noises for Kala and Tarzan, if I'm not mistaken. <laughs> yeah. That was pretty early on. And that was, um, yeah, that was, that was a weird one. I remember that. We had one night to prepare for it, and then we, we went in live to, Dis- it was Disney Character Voices that was doing that. Um, and I think it was sort of a voice match, but not really. They just... They were looking for someone who could sound like a gorilla, but also with human-esque, humanoid expressions and reactions. Glenn Close was amazing, and she was the voice of Kala. So it wasn't really a voice match for Kala, per se, but it was all of the gorilla sounds for her, all of the yells and reactions and screams and what they call Walla. I wanted so badly to do anything for Disney. I I hadn't yet worked for them um, on anything. So the idea of being a part of a... um, of an animated anything for Disney was just beyond the beyond. And I remember thinking, of course, you know, the first real audition I get where I'm going in in person, it's to be a gorilla. <laughs> and I wasn't, I wasn't someone who specialized in animal sound. There are some gifted voice talents who really are just amazing at all of that. And, um, again, I, had, I was pretty new to it all, but I rented Gorillas in the Mist. I went to my local blockbuster and I got Gorillas in the Mist and probably one other, I think I got that one with Charlize Theron. I actually was, it was right before the movie released. That's why it was so unusual was that they were sort of, it was a dream gig in that, you know, when you're, when you're a kid and you picture how animation goes, you don't realize that they record that stuff all ahead of time. So this you know, you you fantasize, okay, I'm going to see the movie in front of me, and I'm going to be doing the voiceover to the movie. And, of course, that's not how it is at all. You're doing it way before the animation has pretty much even happened in, in real life. But in this case, this was part of the post-production. They were sort of after the fact going, okay, we need better, and do we put in real gorilla sounds? No. So I actually did get to go down to a giant sound stage. Um, this was the first time I've, I've since done what's called ADR, you know, and voice replacement and all of that many, many times. But this is my first time. Giant sound stage, microphone right in the middle of this with this pool of light. And the director, Kevin Lima, was there as well as like 80 million other people from the post-production side. And it literally, I think, was maybe a month before the movie released maybe two, but it was very right up against. So 99, yeah. And another great Disney gal. I don't know if we should say she's she's a great Disney gal. Um, her name is Constance, uh, Constance Hatchaway, to be quite frank, and she is the Black Widow Bride who was newly added around, I'm going to say 2006, 2007, to the Haunted Mansion attraction in Disneyland and Walt Disney World. Yeah. A, new, a new character, <laughs> a new storyline. What was the exact pitch that you heard before you got to work on the voice of Constance? Oh, wow. I had already been doing a few things with um, Imagineering with WDI, and hugely, I mean, to say that that was pretty much the, you know, holy grail for me, I mean, it was. To be able to be a voice in the parks, having grown up in the parks with a dad who worked with Imagineering and... The whole reason that I wanted to be in voiceover, as you've already heard, is just 
the Disney voices and getting growing up in Southern California, getting the chance to go there a few times a year. I just like all of the geeks who grew up wanting to be a part of, you know, the Disney legacy, I just geeked out on this these incredible voices in the park and um they never tell you it's very secret it's very secretive and very confidential and so usually when you go in you have no idea what it's for you just know you're going to show up you're going to sign in in the waiting room at imagineering they may give you a script they may not you're going to sign an nda that says you will not discuss anything that you've seen or done or smelled or tasted or whatever and um and then you just take the direction and they they give you just enough to try and get what they need from the audition, but you're not, you don't usually know the context. And I remember going in and there was a number of young females in the waiting room. And then when I went in, the casting director, uh, Brian Nevsky, is amazing. And, and I can't remember if the producer, if the exec producer was there on the first round. Or probably not. And he said, so this is uh, a character who is somewhat of a legacy, somewhat part of a universe that already exists. The character will, whoever gets cast is going to be both the, you know, the face of the character, the voice of the character. Here's the lines. Do you have any questions? And I remember looking at the lines and they were wedding vows. I don't know why, and this is the truth, but for some reason, for some reason, I just had a hunch that it was an extension of an already existing attraction. I don't know why I thought that in looking at the wedding vows, but for whatever reason, I, I remember thinking that. And so I asked, do you want it to feel or sound like something that's already in the park? Is it a like not a voice match, but an extension of a voice that's already in the park? And I remember they both looked at each other, the person who was sitting next to um, Brian Nesky, the casting director, and he said, that's an interesting question. Um, she is, Definitely of the universe of uh, an attraction that's already there. Um, but we can't tell you which one. So just sort of go for the classic attraction sound, but we want to keep it contemporary as well. Keep the pace nice and slow and be pleasant. But maybe there's a little bit of a, maybe a hint of a dark side underneath. They kept it very vague. And I think they wanted to see what I would do with it without imposing, you know, a bunch of direction on it. And I remember having that experience, which most actors can probably relate to, where you're sort of in your body, but also out of your body sort of judging it, going, am I doing okay? Like, am I even getting this? Do I understand what they're asking for? And I had no idea if I had come anywhere close to anything because they were purposely being, um, you know, keeping it close to the vest. And that was that. And um, I had no idea. And then about three weeks later, could have been sooner, but got a call back. We have an idea for this. I'm going to tell you right now what it's for, what they're thinking that it's going to be for. This is still confidential. But we're not finding anybody who matches both the face and the voice of what we're looking for. So we're thinking, I'm thinking that maybe we split it the way has always been the tradition at the mansion, <laughs> where... You know, you've got the person who's the face, and then we've got the person who's the voice, and um, that may be the perfect meshing of the character, but we know that we love your voice, and we think your voice is right for it. So I was super excited, but now at least I knew the universe it was in, and that gave me some really nice reference points. And I remember I pulled an all-nighter. I stayed up all night from nerves and just oh, my, I have to be true to this legacy. I have to find somehow a voice that feels like it's part of the mansion but still contemporary and relevant and um, still didn't have much direction other than we wanted to feel of the universe. The recording session, once, it, once I finally got the game, was it was so short, I was begging them to let me keep going. I mean, we were in and out, I think, in 10 minutes, and they knew what they wanted, and they, they didn't want it to sound over anything. They wanted to feel natural and playful. I could have gone obviously doing it all day, just knowing, oh my God, I'm going to be a voice in the classic mansion. I can't, this will never happen again. There will never be another thing that's classic. That's so, you know, there's pirates and there's haunted mansion. 
And <laughs> you're never going to find an opportunity where you're going to be a part of all those classic voices and somehow get a chance to be right up next to them. So I knew it was a once in a lifetime thing, so I wanted to go on forever, but they only needed about 10 minutes with me. <laughs> <laughs> and what did your friends and family say when they finally got to see it in person or, or hear the news? I think the reaction for me and anybody, you know, it's, it's weird because, first of all, I've been going on that attraction since I was four, maybe younger. I know my dad tricked me into going on because he said it was the magic castle because I was scared. And I've been, you know, seeing it, living it, breathing it since I was four, and you know it. That's what's so great about it. Is it never gets, for me anyway, it never gets old. And yet suddenly there's this new character, and not only is it a new character, it's your voice. So it doesn't, your brain doesn't quite know what to do with that. And I don't mean that, I'm not trying to sound, you know, mystical or anything. Literally, I think probably the first 25, 30 times that I went on it, it still was weird because it's the mansion, and yet suddenly, wait, that's me. And I've been with people, you know, oh, no, I want to go with you. I want to see your reaction. I want to, I want to sit next to the bride. And we all get kind of weirded out for a second. It's like, oh, my God, that is you. Oh, my God, that's totally you. <laughs> so it definitely has been weird for people who know the attraction, know me, and then suddenly they're hearing the voice. So I've heard a rumor that besides growing up at the theme parks with your father who was working with Imagineering, that you also worked at the Disney theme parks. I did. I was a cast member. <laughs> yep. Um, I knew when I interviewed. <laughs> I, I didn't even have a car when I did this, and we lived up in, you know, like Los Angeles proper, and my mom was like, really, you're going to get a job at Disneyland? How, how are you planning to get there? And I said, I don't know. I'll figure it out. I, I applied without even having a, a mode of transportation. Um, and I ended up learning how to drive a stick so that I could drive down every day um, on the five. And this is before they expanded the five. So I, I probably logged in about four hours a day. I really wanted to be working at the park. So um, I, I knew that I wanted to be doing something where you got a chance to speak. I was already, you know, I was one of those obnoxious tots that at the age of four had discovered acting and just knew that theater was where I was meant to be. So um, I, even in the interview, I remember saying he was asking me questions and he was supposed to go through, they're supposed to consider you for everything when they meet with you, at least back in the day that I was um, doing this. They're supposed to look at you and consider how you might, where you might best fit in, how they can best cast you. And I really wanted to do storybook land because of getting to speak on the microphone and tell fairy tales. I probably brought it up like five times in the interview to the point where I think he must have said, it's duly noted that you would like to be considered for storybook land, but there is quite a wait list for it and you would have to audition for it. And I was like, bring it on. I can say, honestly, it was my first official voiceover gig and um, I loved it. Well, now I have three Disney questions I always ask my guests. They're called the Fab Three. So we'll start with the Donald one. And the Donald one is, as a child, what Disney film was one of your favorites to watch over and over again? Pinocchio. And our goofy question, what Disney character do you think would be your best friend if you met them in person? Um, best friend, best friend, best friend. Wow. Probably Pocahontas, what she stood for and, and who she was. That seems to come to mind because she was pretty grounded and, you know. And our Mickey question, if I asked you to name any Disney song at this very moment, what immediately comes to mind? The, the opening theme song to Peter Pan. Thank you so much, mm -hmm. Kat, for being on the show. I just want to make sure I send listeners to your website, which I'm going to include all your links to your social media pages below in our show notes. And you can head to Kat's website, also her Instagram page, her Twitter and Facebook pages. Go ahead, follow her over there, listeners. Again, thank you so much for coming on the show, Kat. This was a lot of fun, and I hope we can have you back on the show soon. Thanks, Pam. It was a pleasure to be here.
for better or for...